Taylor now as Burns comes in and a beautiful goal. What a smashing goal. And how well this kid deserves it. An outstanding young defender at the time was Joe Gallagher. He had a knack of scoring vital goals like the one at Hillsborough in the heartbreaking semi-final against Fulham in 1975. Every time people talk about that, you just reminded me about it again, Tom. It's uh, a desperate, desperate feeling, desperate things come over you. I know it's, uh, it's only a game, ultimately, football, but for, for Birmingham City supporters, uh, and I count myself amongst them, lucky enough to be amongst them, and lucky enough to play for the club, it was a desperate disappointment. You felt that the team to get was Fulham. And I don't think we were overconfident. I think it was a matter of thinking this is our best chance we'll ever get. And, and to say we blew it on that Saturday, we put it mildly. I mean, Fulham went ahead. Uh, we struggled for the majority of the game, and we were fortunate that Joe Gallagher put us back in it to give us another chance. Pendry. To Campbell. And back for Page. Chipped in again towards Burns. Gallagher's right in there. And Gallagher scores, 1-1. One, one. And then we had a couple of days break between then and the main road game. And again, I think we took some unbelievable support. I think it was perhaps 20-odd thousand people we took north. Um, that night, I think, I think it's fair to say, um, we played very, very well. We played very well. I know that I went back a, a central defender alongside Joe, and I felt that uh, I am professional. I've always been a professional. It was one of the better games that I'd ever had for the club. Uh, Mellor had a great time for Fulham. Uh, we just couldn't score, we couldn't score. We battered them. We didn't look in any trouble at the back. Uh, we turned around, no goals at half-time, no goals at extra time, no goals into the second half of extra time. And then perhaps with, what, 15 or 20 seconds to go, I think they knocked a ball in from the right, and I don't know, was it Mitchell or something like that got on the end of it. It bobbled off his chest. It went, it went by big Dave. Dave tried to get it. Joe went, fell over him. And it was unbelievable. It was all the, the earth had stopped. The ball just rolled in the back of the net. And all I can remember then was falling on the floor. I fell on the floor and I looked round, and there were a few other people fell on the floor. And it was silence. I mean, there were a few, a few thousand Fulham people, I think, cheering, but Birmingham City people were silent. I think we went back to the halfway line, kicked off in the ref blew his whistle. And my biggest thought from then on, I can remember now, I just ran off the pitch, I ran straight away into the dressing room and I locked myself in the toilet. I don't think I came out for quarter of an hour. Coach Willie Bell replaced Goodwin soon after, and his new signings, Gary Jones and John Connolly, soon won over the fans against Aston Villa. Give it. Curling pass there for Francis to run onto. Beautifully done. Chip down and Burns gets the equaliser. Kenny Burns goes to the Miller end and it's 1 1. Birmingham brought the people, everybody back. Page down for Jones. And Kendall knocks it early. Francis, Kendall, Connolly. Good skills, but a hurry though. Caradis is coming back at him. Connolly keeps going against, and he scores a beautiful goal. Connolly, his first goal for his new club in only his second game for them. And he won that goal to put Birmingham City in front 2-1 to enliven those fans from St Andrews here at Villa Park. The 1976-77 season proved a personal triumph for Trevor Francis. He was ever present with 21 goals, earning him his England place. In the return match against Villa, there were some crude attempts to stop his flowing runs. Villa opened the scoring, but that season nothing could stop Francis as Villa soon found out. Twisting the defence inside out, he sets up Terry Hibbert for the first goal, then earned his side a penalty to win the match, sending the 43,000 fans home delirious.
Despite achieving the double over Villa, Birmingham only finished in mid-table that season. And after losing their opening four games of the 77-78 campaign, Willie Bell was sacked and club director Sir Ralph Ramsey took over, becoming the first knight to manage a football club. Ill health forced his retirement in March 1978 and Blackburn's up-and-coming manager Jim Smith was invited to take over the hot seat by chairman Keith Coombs, who hoped he could revive the team's flagging fortunes. His first problem was to persuade spy-on cop favourite Trevor Francis that his future lay at St Andrews. I've never had any problems with any player while I've been a manager because I, I'm, a, I'm a player's man, really, and I think I can communicate with them and get them on my side. And This is what I've got to do with Trevor, and uh, I hope that I'm going to be successful in showing Trevor that we're going to be successful because I think that's what he wants. He's an ambitious man for success, not, not financial reward at all. And I'm the same. I want to be successful, and I want to work hard to be successful, and I want Trevor Francis playing with Birmingham City when we are successful. Do you feel that having that million pounds tied round your neck will be a burden in your playing career now? Initial optimism fell away um, with a run of poor not, results, uh, and Francis moment. finally had his wish uh, to leave granted. Brian Clough offering him the chance of success he so richly deserved. The compensation for Blues was £1 million, smashing the British transfer record. And when do you expect to play your first game for Forest? When I pick him. With Francis gone and morale low, Smith's first full season ended in relegation. It was clearly time to rebuild. Gambling on experience, Smith secured Archie Gemmell from Forest for £150,000. Off the line by O'Brien. Good cover. He was followed by former England international Colin Todd from Everton. Christie, the touch. Mare in and just robbed in time by Todd. The arrival of the classy Frank Worthington immediately gave the copper a new hero to replace Trevor Francis. Well, I mean, that's, it's nice to be mentioned in the same breath as Trevor, who's, who's done, you know, who's done magnificently for Birmingham City uh, on and off the field. So, uh, you know, that is a compliment to me. So, uh, you know, but uh, I can only say that uh, uh, the feeling was reciprocated. Did well, I get that right? Reciprocal. <laughs> the feeling was reciprocal. <laughs> it was, uh, the feeling was mutual. That's <laughs> Gemmell knocks that down. Worthington! Great season. You know, I mean, I enjoyed uh, every minute of playing for Birmingham City. You know, I had two, uh, two and a half great years here. And I'll leave the games there for, uh, for the fans to be entertained to see quality football and, and to go out and play uh, attacking football and score goals. Jimmy Smith, uh, he, he wanted that in his team. And, uh, you know, it was a very enjoyable side to play in. Sun. Now, illuminating the penalty area. The ball down, Birchin. And Birchin stabs it into the back of the net. 1-0 in Birmingham City. Just over seven and a half minutes gone. Linex gets there, gets a touch. Worthington and a chance for Gallagher. And a goal for Joe Gallagher. 2 1. And the ground erupts. And Gibbons in. And he got the touch. And a very brave header by Birchin. 1 0. Birmingham City. Blues needed a point against Notts County in their final game of the season to be sure of going up. For bravery by Virgin with the boots of Kilt Line round his ears. Ivanovich dancing in the centre of his goals, and he does try it, and he's there! Yes! Oh! What a beauty! Alan Kirbishley! Gemmel. This will come down to Birchin, a touch off to Dillon! And 3 2 to Birmingham City! Kevin Dillon! Notts County equalise late in the game and press forward, but with keeper Jeff Whelans in heroic form, they held on for a 3-3 draw. And hooks breaking perfectly, right in behind everybody. And drives a beauty! Oh! Well, I tell you what, have a piece of that, he says. 
And what a save he brought out of Jeff Whelans. And he blows the final whistle. And Birmingham City are back in the first division. And Jim Smith is one of the first men out there to grab Archie Gamble and come off the park with him as the fans... It still annoys me, though, to this day that Smithy uh, left me out the uh, the promotion game the actual day uh, when we did get up against Notts County. And uh, I'll never forget it. We, we got back in the dressing room after the game and, and nobody knew, uh, you know, whether to laugh, cry or, or whatever, because uh, uh, I think everything hinged on the Chelsea results. And uh, anyway, it eventually filtered through that uh, that we'd gone up. But uh, it was uh, it was it was a, a strange moment then, although uh, Obviously, a very happy one, uh, ultimately. Their first season back in the top flight was promising, with Blues finishing 13th in the league. The early part of the following season produced this truly memorable match. Dennis hooking it across the face of the goals, and it's a fine goal in from Broadhurst. It's 1-1. Come in, Broadhurst. Back to Brocken. Chip in, Evans knocks it down to Dillon. That's wide for Dennis. It'll drop for Watmore, got there, Evans! Fine goal! Beautiful stuff! Oh, nothing wrong with that at all. 2-1 Birmingham City. Tony Evans. Oh, and Gemmel has a chance now for Brocken. And Watmore has scored. And Birmingham City are in front, 3-2. It'll come for Dennis. They're lining up to get at this. And one more is there with the winner. Despite this great victory over Forrest, a run of bad results saw Smith become yet another Blues management casualty. Absolutely no chance at all. Ron Saunders was brought in by Keith Coombs as a last desperate gamble to bring success to St Andrews. Saunders invested in Mick Hartford, whose crucial late goals against Coventry and Spurs kept Blues in the first division two seasons in a row. Not a bad looking cross. Harper! He's got it! Yes! Mick Harper! And Mick Harper goes handing away to those Birmingham City fans! Harford into Hopkins. Phillips and decides it's time to run perfectly. He's onside. Can he finish? Also can. 1 0 to Birmingham. Oh, just the start they wanted. Harford's jump. Down in for Handysides. Harford's continued his run. Waiting in the area. Handysides can get the cross in. Up goes Harford. And it's gone in. I think off the goalkeeper. There was to be no great escape act the following season, with relegation to Division 2 inevitable. Financial restrictions forced Saunders to wheel and deal in the transfer market to build a team capable of promotion. And there were some memorable performances, including a 2-0 win at Crystal Palace, thanks to goals by Robert Hopkins and Wayne Clark. That was probably my best season in football. I think I scored 9 or 10 goals, which is a lot for me. And I was playing up front with Mick Harford and we had, we had Tony Coton and Noel Blake, some great players. And I always remember that season because I think it equaled the record number of away wins for the club for anybody, I think, which was 13, I think. A difficult team to beat Birmingham City in that year? Um, yeah, I think majority of games we won 1-0 in the last minutes, especially away from home. But in the second division, you know, as long as you get up there and get back into the first. Another fine win at Portsmouth saw a superb hat-trick from David Geddes. Ray Ranson. For Daly, and squeeze the pass through for Clark. Daly again, and Geddes on the near post made it count. Fool's corner. Knight in trouble. Geddes, Hopkins, and that was a tremendous recovery by Alan Knight. And Knight misses it again. Geddes, the goal is given. Has passed over the responsibility for the free kick to Daly. It's Geddes who missed it and might have got the final touch. It's a hat trick. Uh, we were going out and people were expected to get beat by us. They were going out. You could see the fear on their faces because we had such a good, a good team. And Saunders gave that impression that you know that uh, we could beat anybody. 
and he had that sort of air about him. You know, he just even getting off the coach, and that you know, the fans would see him, and the and, and the opposing players, I'm sure, saw him and think, "Cracky," you know. I mean, I'm, he was a top manager. You've had hundreds and hundreds of league games to your credit, but you've got this fabulous love affair with the Birmingham City fans. Yeah, I think they they've enjoyed all the goals I've scored. <laughs> it's none in six years. It's, it's pretty impressive, really. Uh, I mean, I was going to say I'd let my goals do all the talking, but you know, you don't want somebody silent on here. So, yeah. The, they, they, I think they realise that I'm not over-talented, but I, I give all I've got, and they can associate with things like that. And uh, there's nothing worse than being one of, the, one of these guys that, that got uh, skill in abundance, but doesn't try, and they, they, they soon spot that. I mean, the fans are no mugs, they soon spot people like that, and they take a dislike to them. Uh, and then, on the other hand, when they see somebody giving everything they've got, like, they, they go for it, and it, it did me a world of good. I mean, it really did. It was, it was a fantastic feeling, going out and singing your name all the time. And, uh, it, you know, it makes me, big enough as I am, but it makes me feel ten foot tall, you know, with, with the fans. And, you know, they, they, sh they showed it in, in picking me for Player of the Year last year. And uh, the London branch gave me the Player of the Year as well. So it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Brian Roberts, second Birmingham half, also beat champions Oxford 3-0 at the Manor Ground to bounce straight back to the top flight. What a splendid goal it was. Off the pitch, Blues were in a terrible financial state. Chairman Keith Coombs had had enough handing over control to local entrepreneur Ken Weldon, who'd already performed economic miracles at Warsaw. On his first day at St Andrews, he spelled out the problems the club faced. But I fear that Birmingham City Football Club is in dire straits. The problems went only in the boardroom. On the pitch, a demoralised Blues were fast heading towards the second division. It turned out that Ken Weldon had arrived in the nick of time. Well, it was apparent that they was considering calling in the receiver. And I quote from the minutes. The meeting commenced with a lengthy discussion on the club's current financial position. It was felt that 500,000 would be necessary to reconstruct the club's finances. And if no further solution was forthcoming, suggest the bank call in a receiver. In fact, they owed in excess of three million pounds. And uh, I thought it was a challenge and it was quite out of order to sit and see Birmingham City go under. I took the club over on the Monday at 11 o'clock in the morning and I arrived at the club at 12.30 to find all the players on the stairs who had not been paid the previous fortnight's wages. So the first thing I had to do was put my hand in my pocket and find £50,000 immediately. As if relegation wasn't bad enough for Blues' long-suffering supporters, the ultimate embarrassment saw them dumped out of the FA Cup by non-league Altrincham. It was to prove the final straw for Ron Saunders, who quit the following day. John Bond and Gary Pendry both came and went during three years of financial restraint, the result of which was second division mediocrity. After winning the financial battle, Ken Weldon searched for new blood to lead Blues into the 90s. There was a number of buyers, and uh, one had got to weigh up whether or not there was interest in football or development, and I reached the conclusion that the Kumars, football-minded people, was the people for the job. The Kumar brothers arrived too late to prevent Blues slipping into the third division for the first time in their proud history but they readily accepted the challenge. The rebirth of the Blues was underway.
I hope to bring a different attitude to Birmingham City and an attitude where if you look at the grandeur of this stadium, there's tremendous facilities. There is no excuse that as long as we are able to relate back to our supporters who have a very strong affinity for this football club. This football club, I feel, can be up there with the big five, no problem. The terms of support, the support is definitely out there. But over the years, that the support and the club themselves have um, the severed ties. And I think it's, it's a very big part and in, an important job for me now in the future to bring those supporters back to the football club and generate the facilities that we've got at this football club to generate the finances that in the future, and it may take three, maybe five years, that in the future we have a sound financial footing where not only we're able to retain our better players but compete in the transfer market with the better players yet again. When you arrived at the club that first day, that first week, what, what were your feelings? What were the sort of problems you faced? Well, I think um, it's very typical of what was happening on the pitch. There was very, very low morale. Um, the players themselves, they were frightened to be picked on a match day. Um, the crowd obviously were giving them a bad time because they've been relegated now for the first time in the 114 year history. And it was a very big problem basically to, to lift morale and install a newfound discipline and confidence and enthusiasm about, not just on the playing side, but also of course behind the scenes because it, uh, if you have panic and, uh, and lack of enthusiasm and lack of morale, it tends to fester right the way through the football club. When we interviewed Dave Mackay, literally within 15 minutes he was offered the job because within the 15 minutes he imposed upon myself that his main concern was to bring an attacking, attractive team at St Andrews. He wants them to go out on that pitch and express themselves. And it doesn't just stop with the star strikers, it's, it goes all the way through the team, whether you're a fullback or a centre half. If you've got the ability, you do the positive things and you express yourself and you enjoy a game of football. I think people, the supporters of Birmingham City, will feel that the flair and the enthusiasm is coming back to St Andrews, which I think it has to a certain degree this season. This is the main reason why we installed Dave McCoy, because we feel that he, he preaches the pure football. Well, I love to see good football, you know. I love to see the Liverpool style. Everybody loves to see that and wish they were Liverpool. But there's only one Liverpool in the country. And, uh, but we would like to be able to think that we could get somewhere near them. When you were a player, Dave, in your, in your heyday with Spurs, what were your impressions of Birmingham when you used to come here with Spurs? Well, I, the, the one thing that I remember very much, we had a 3-3 cup tie here after leading 3 nothing, and they scared the pants off us in the last 10 or 15 minutes when they actually Harris scored the goal, thought we had lost it. 3-3, uh, we won the replay, but tremendous crowd that was here and always on the far side, on the right-hand side, with tremendous support that Birmingham's got. In the past, Birmingham City, when it's had good youngsters, has sold them. Are you going to be in that position? Well, I think anybody that, when it comes to buying and selling, you've got to say, if you're offered a certain amount, like half a million for one particular player, do I think he's worth that money or don't I, you know? And if you're going to get that sort of money, I've got somebody else in the back of my mind that's actually, I think, is better than that player that was selling. But we won't be selling players just for the sake of selling them. You sell your good players and you'll be in the fourth division. You uh, hadn't been at the club long when you uh, got Bobby Ferguson to join you. What are his qualities? Uh, well, he's an excellent coach, brilliant coach, and he keeps on the players. He keeps the players on their toes, and uh, he does give them plenty of stick. And uh, I think he's another one like Bill Shankly. Have you ever met Bill Shankly? All he would talk about is football. Um, but he knew the business, and, to, and so does Bobby. <laughs> Yeah, you're quiet with some of them and you're, you're noisy with other ones, you know, they need stirring up, you've got to stir some up and you've got to calm other ones down, you know. Some are pretty pretty much tensed up, others are a little bit too relaxed, so you're, you're trying to wear the pros and the cons up and treat each one each one in, in, individually, really. You're also a strict disciplinarian, you like disciplined footballers. Yes, I think without spirit and without discipline, your team's got nothing. Without spirit, they're the two. They're th the two things are omnipotent. They, 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 you know, they, you can't do without them. You can have skill as much as you like. If you've got no spirit and discipline, you've got nothing. It will collapse on you. The reason I'm in the game is because I love it, really. And so when you love it, you, it's a passionate game played by hopefully passionate people. And uh, so I mean, obviously, you can't just keep your mouth shut. You know, you've got to live and live every kick. Really.
Samesh Kumar's desire to make blues a family club saw a quick reintroduction of the junior blues. Two main aims, I suppose. The one would be to uh, hopefully get these young supporters uh, following Birmingham City and once having started here, want to follow them for the rest of their lives. And secondly, a little part of me that uh, detests what we see sometimes happening on the terraces at football clubs and hoping that the youngsters coming through will also detest it and behave in a bit, bit, bit of a better way. The club was determined to become more in touch with the local community. Part of the plan involved the probation service. They got in touch with us and asked if some uh, young children could come along who come from broken homes and are young offenders and could they be of uh, some assistance with you know, uh, some work on the ground. So we find them small jobs, small tidying up jobs where they, they come along and uh, you know, we give them a drink and what have you, and they, uh, they seem to enjoy it. Did the probation service think it works? I think so, yeah, because while the, the boys are here, we have a, ch a chance to chat to them and, you know, ask them, you know, wh what have they done, and, uh, you know, hopefully we can put them on the straight and narrow. Another part of the community project involves taking the club out to local schools. Good. Not too bad. I think it's coming now. Well done, Gareth. Well done, Anthony. Good. That's it. Well done. Good one. Come to the goal. You're going too far away. Ball. Not only will the kids benefit from the coaching, but the club is fulfilling the chairman's promise to forge stronger links with the local community. Come back, come back. Good luck. The next thing you must do. Move. Right, you must pass and move. It's no good passing and saying... Oh, There's a lot of soccer schools about where they're paying 30, 40 or 50 pounds a week and all we're charging is 50 pence a day. So but they can get good training, you know, and it brings it back to the, to the community, to the kids that perhaps wouldn't normally uh, afford it, which I think is great. There's a lot of talent about it that, uh, that probably would have gone unnoticed. We've got one lad who comes to soccer coaching on a Saturday morning who's actually going for uh, goalkeeping trials with the club. Um, and we brought that to the attention of the club. So perhaps, and perhaps from the, if the, uh, some of these kids can go on to be professionals. It's there's bound to be, out of these numbers, there's bound to be one or two percent will get through and become footballers, I would think. Yeah, what we'd like to see is the sessions that we do offer. Maybe there may be some young stars that may become professional footballers with Birmingham City. And we found them through our coaching schemes. Any youngster making the grade comes under the wing of youth team coach Fred Davis. His record of bringing through youngsters for the first team is second to none. You've got Sturridge, you've got Yates, you've got Peer, you've got Tate, you've got Clarkson. Uh, Frayne is in the uh, in the youth has come through the youth policy, and Kevin Ashley has come through the youth policy. Do we get more than our fair share at Birmingham? I think we've done we've done quite well over the uh, over the time I've been doing the job of uh, about two and a half years now um, with the young boy Rutherford who, who's had two 20 minutes in the first team. Um, there's been 11 boys gone in. What's the react the relationship between you and the, the the boys? Is it like almost like father son? Well, it is. I kick backsides, Tom. Obviously, you've got to have a little bit of discipline with them, but uh, I always put my arm around them. After I mean, at, at this present time of talking, it's it's been. Uh, a difficult time in terms of I've had seven second year boys who have just coming up to whether they're getting signed pro and I've told the boys this morning we're taking three of them which all right the other four are very disappointed but I'll do what I can for them one boy's already been to another football club and had a week's trial and there's another boy going out next week on a week's trial so I'll do what I can to to uh, to ensure that they you know they have trials elsewhere as well Man. Over. Who are the youngsters that are coming through now that you think have got a good chance of it? Uh, a boy by the name of Francis, not, uh, not Trevor. <laughs> but he's another strike.